Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Media Boat Podcast, your weekly shenanigans where we talk about movies, TV, music, and video games. Not necessarily in that order. My name is Mike. His name is Matt. My name is Matt. His name is Mike. Thank you for joining us on this very special episode. Actually, it's not very special. It just has a special number. Uh, This is episode 420. Uh, folks, we made it. Yep, if uh, you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, clearly there's no blazing happening here, but uh, feel free as a listener to engage in whatever activities hey, you want. We're, we're going to blaze through this podcast, okay? <laughs> yeah. We're going to sift through all the weeds of the news. <laughs> all right, we're not going to blow smoke up your ass this episode. No, <laughs> no. no, we're just going to be blunt and right on time. Uh huh. Yep, yeah, all of that is true. <laughs> And also today is January the 30th, 2024. The next time we speak to y'all, it will be February. So we're almost done with the first month of the year. And you know what that means? Grammys, Super Bowl, award oh. shows, Valentine's Day, uh, Super Bowls, Super Bowl commercials, Groundhog's Day, Super Bowl, ads. Am I getting close? I was going to say spring training baseball, but yes, sure. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to all of those things and more. But first, we got a podcast to do, so let's get to it. Yes, and we always start, start with the... start at the top? We always start with the music section. Start the music section with the billboard, and start the billboard with the Hot 100. And the hottest song in the land is Lovin' On Me. Not literally, but the song is yeah. Lovin' On Me by Jack Harlow. At number two, even though it's January, it still is a... Cruel Summer by Taylor Swift. Coming in at three Indeed. is Greedy by Tate McRae. At four, Lose Control by Teddy Swims. And at number five, I Remember Everything <laughs> by it's Zach true. Bryan. But really, it's featuring Casey Musgraves. As for your album chart, you'll be on board 200. At number one is The American Dream by 21 Savage. At number two, One Thing at a Time by Morgan Wallen. Coming in at three, for All the Dogs by Drake. Mm -hmm. At four is Saviors by Green Day. And rounding out your top five, Stick Season by Noah Kahan. Uh, as for that Green Day album, you can listen to our thoughts on about that on last week's episode. Yes, we talked about that a little last time. Um, yeah, uh, no, no surprises this week. I think the biggest surprise is that uh, I guess all those Green Day fans couldn't quite get Saviors to number one. But uh, hey, what oh, are we you tried. Do? <laughs> oh, all, all handful of you. Yep. If you like any of those albums, we have new releases which are very similarly titled with what now <laughs> and yes. what do we do now? I swear that's a coincidence. Has to be because what now is by Brittany Howard and what do we do now is by Jay Massis. Yes. Two yeah, different yeah. artists, two similar sounding albums. And that's it. No other new releases this week. Well, that's because it's uh Ground, it is Groundhog Day. They are coming out on Groundhog Day. Yep. So, you know, it's true. you can just be listening to the same Sunny and Cher songs over and over <laughs> and over and over and over again, as we know you yeah. will. It's true. But let's get into some music news, shall we? Should we we start shall. with Nicki Minaj and her beef, well, yes. continued beef. Continue. With Megan the Stallion. Yeah, has absolutely boiled over this week. It's been back and forth. Well, actually, less back and forth and more Nikki just saying things at Megan and Megan not reacting to them. So, so Nicki Minaj's <laughs> Bigfoot, which is an apparent response, or as I like to say, the diss track, uh, in retaliation to Megan the Stallion's recently released single titled that is yes. hiss. Uh, 
which set the internet ablaze on Monday for its raunchy quips and references to Megan's life and career. The juicy drama between the pair of hitmakers hit its boiling point over the weekend after his got its debut on January 25th. Megan's song touched on various aspects of her tumultuous life as a public figure, but it was one in line in particular that caught the attention of Miss Minaj. The line goes, quote, this is the line, okay? I'm not saying this is the line. <laughs> quote, these hoes don't be mad at Megan. These hoes mad at Megan's law. And quote, uh, as Megan raps fervently on his <laughs> Quote, I don't really know what the problem is, but I guarantee y'all don't want me to start. End quote. The lyric was picked apart by listeners who linked it as an apparent dig at Me- from Megan to Minaj's husband, Kenneth Petty, who is a registered sex offender. Yeah. And the beef continues. Yeah. Well, so, okay. Uh, If that makes any sense, uh, you know, who knows? But um, basically all you need to know is that Nikki is making this all about her, even if it's not necessarily about her and more just a line that just happened to Brian and Megan liked it. Um, Yeah, it could be a little stray uh, that relates to something in Nikki's life. But she is making this whole thing about her released a diss track that's bad and... (laughs) Yeah, and everybody's just focused on, like, Nikki just being very, very, very out there about this. It's not really that big of news, but then again, it's the only thing music people talked about this week, so what are you going to do? It is weird that we're getting this all in front of a a Grammy telecast on Sunday, and uh, yeah, I don't think either of them are even planning on being there, I don't believe. I don't think either of them are having their... I don't think they're eligible. I want to say Nikki is there to uh, perform. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. Know. All right. Uh, but speaking of the Grammys, we should <laughs> yeah. probably uh, talk about the top three awards. We don't have to go through all the awards, but we should probably talk about the upcoming record of the year, album of the year, and song of the year, and figure out. Where we kind of land. Uh, so I pulled up our trusty uh, Google sheet here as we choose uh, what's going to happen. And it looks like you are picking Kill Bill by SZA for record of the year. <laughs> that is my horse. I am sticking to it. I really think that she deserves it. I think that it's quite a production. And I'm pretty confident going in here that that's going to be the favorite all right feel free to correct me if you if you're wrong i actually haven't seen well, your picks yet because you took a while to enter them you're wrong because it's going to be taylor swift anti-hero Mm-mm. grammy look look do, do, do i, I don't think it's going to be vampire i don't think it's going to be olivia rodrigo <laughs> oh there, there's my pick yeah i was gonna say okay you are not done doing this that's why no, well, I'm not while doing you this. steam on these, um, yes. yes, the Grammys are next week. I will post our predictions on the website soon. Um, so look forward to that. Yeah, um, but I'm going with Taylor Swift and Antihero for both record and song of the year. But not for album of the year. No. That's going to Janelle Monet. <laughs> I'm sticking to that. That was my number one album from last year. I'm sticking with it. I don't care how wrong I'd be. I don't care if I got egg in my face. I want to see <laughs> it win. Yeah, I don't know. I think y'all are um, y'all are going with what you like more than what you think is actually going to win. That is what I will say. Yeah, but at least I think we're going to agree on a best new artist with Victoria Monet. Yeah, probably. It seems like um, my, my usual uh, rule is if you're nominated in a lot of categories, then you probably have a chance at best new artist. Yeah, if you're nominated for album of the year and record of the year, yeah, you're probably, probably gonna be getting dressed new <laughs> artist. <laughs> it's probably the person that you go with. Yep. Uh, but yes, I will fill the rest of this out, and we will see who wins. Come next week. 
<laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Yeah, by Tuesday, we'll be able to talk about that. Yes. So we'll have all our Grammy hot takes next episode. Next but episode. in the meantime, did you listen to anything? Uh, no, not really. Nothing important. If not, then we can move on into video mm-hmm. games, or we start with new releases. Yep. Including Jujutsu Juj- Kaisen, colon, Cursed Clash for everything. It's out. You got it. You can play it. We also have Persona 3 Reloaded for everything but the Switch. Uh, we have Song of Nunu, colon, A League of Legends Story for PS4, PS5, Xbox One, and Xbox Series X. Sorry, PC. You can just play regular <laughs> League of Legends. Or you can play Blaz Blue Entropy Effect for the PC. That is a fighting game. Blast Blues are fighting games. Or you could play One Punch Man, colon, World for the PC. But everything, get out of the way. The big release is here. <laughs> Maybe if they decide to actually release it. Uh, Suicide Squad, <laughs> colon, Kill the Justice League for the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. Officially yes. out this week. Believe it or not. Unless the game decides it wants to finish it for you. <laughs> I don't so, know if you yes, saw that what you're referring to what you're referring to is I guess there was a bug in the early access release where the game would just autocomplete and people were really confused. Apparently, yep. as of today, uh Rocksteady confirmed that they will be issuing $20 of in-game currency to everybody affected by that bug. <laughs> so sure. Wow, I get to complete the auto complete the game and 20 bucks from Rocksteady? I you know. guys are too much. <laughs> They're just being very nice about it. Yes. Well, let's go to something that's not nice then, shall we? <laughs> as always. As always, as we begin the year of 2024, yet another round of layoffs has happened. This time, part of Microsoft and Xbox. Mm-hmm. So Microsoft's head of gaming has confirmed that 1,900 staff members will be laid off across Activision Blizzard, Bethesda, and Xbox. In a message sent to staff obtained by IGN, uh, Phil Spencer said that Microsoft would provide, quote, full support to those who are impacted during the transition including severance benefits informed by local employment laws, close quote. According to the exec, the decision has been made af- had been made after Microsoft and Activision Blizzard's leadership teams, quote, set priorities, identified areas of overlap, and ensured that we're all aligned on the best opportunities for growth, close quote. Blizzard's president, Mike Yabara, and its chief design officer, Alan Adham, are leaving the studio, which has also seen a previously announced survival game canceled. Uh, is that the, that's not Deus Ex, right? That's different. So no, what you're thinking about is other layoffs that happened over the last couple of days yeah. uh, with IDOS. Um, that's what IDOS it is. owns that IP, and that project has been essentially canceled yes so yeah unrelated but you're on the right track yeah just same thing happened just two different companies uh but yeah this is actually kind of expected whenever there's a full-on merger um they companies do uh, expect cuts when there is overlap in duties overlap in uh, job titles as mergers it just becomes part of the floppy mess Note that this has nothing to do with the $69 billion made that they could have spent keeping these people. Yeah. So apparently, from what I've been able to tell from people who are have been reporting on this story that know what's going on, yes, it's very hard to square up the fact that Microsoft is a company that last week bragged about how they're the first three or the second, I guess, company in history to be valued at over $3 billion. Or, sorry. The other being Apple, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. Or trillion. Is it billion trillion. or trillion? It was something ridiculous. Trillion. Anyways, 
And so, so yeah, like not only are they saying that, but they're also saying now is that yes, how do you square that with oh, but also mo- all these all this staff has to be let go. So it goes down to the thing we've been talking about for the last handful of these stories, which is growth. Mm-hmm. One note: this is not Microsoft. This is Xbox. This is specifically the gaming division, and that's actually the key to unlocking why this happened. If you look at a list of all the different divisions under Microsoft's umbrella, and if you look at just pure numbers about growth numbers right now, the gaming division is losing money. And part of the reason why they wanted to do that acquisition in the first place is that Microsoft had money to hopefully funnel into uh, Xbox to expand Xbox's capacity to make more games to eventually make more money. But you're right. The thing that you do when you do that, though, is you make jobs redundant, and redundancies always leads to layoffs. So yes, you're right saying that the mergers always cause this kind of drama. So the easy answer is like, well, why don't they just put that money somewhere else? The the question is, is why don't they put that money towards the labor? Well, the reason is, is because that doesn't funnel into growth. It's not just enough for Xbox to break even. It's not even just enough for them to make a little bit of money. The shareholders want to see that number exponentially rise. Ooh, like everything, I know. Ugh, it sucks. I don't like any of this. I'm just saying that this is what the companies feel. And this is why companies do this. Is they see all these other departments in Microsoft, like Office and you know Cloud Server, Azure. And they're probably looking at Xbox and being like, well, why doesn't Xbox have an arrow that's going up like this forever? They have one that's kind of going like this, maybe even a little down. We can't do that. We need to figure out how to cut something, some sort of cost, so that way that arrow starts peaking up again. That's where these decisions come. And the story, and the the question every time, though, and the legitimate question to ask here, well, why is that money coming from eliminating people down here instead of coming from the paychecks of the people up here? that made these decisions in the first place. And so, yeah, we're, it's just yet another example that we've been seeing countless examples of lately, of the onus has to be put back on the decision makers, not on the people just making their games and doing their jobs. And it sucks to see another nearly 2,000 people laid off, especially people from Blizzard who were told, oh, by the way, yeah, we hired you remote, during the pandemic because we needed people to work on our big projects, including the survival game. And then we asked everybody to come and move to Irvine because we don't want them to work remotely anymore. So these are people, a lot of these people were people who relocated their families and their well, like their lives to Irvine, California, which you and I know more than probably most people <laughs> listening to this podcast is not a cheap place to live, especially if you were living in, say, Wisconsin, you know, like, or something with a way lower, like, ceiling. And now all of a sudden they've lost their jobs. How are they supposed to afford to stay in Irvine? It's, it's obnoxious. None of this is, none of this makes sense, but business. I want to compound one other aspect on this. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if you've read on this, but people who were laid off were also the same people who said, who were told, don't worry about your jobs. And don't sign up for the union. Ding, 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 ding. So yes, I'm glad you brought this up. Because yes, some ra- a wrinkle that came out in the last couple of days about this is that the people who had joined the union, which were, were the safe. QA testers, were safe. Microsoft this whole time during the acquisition said that they would honor the union agreements, that they wouldn't mess with them in any way. They would leave them untouched. And more or less, this has proven out that they've done that, even through this process. So yeah, you're right. It is weird uh, because we're so used to like these companies attacking the unions directly. This time, Microsoft was like, nope, we said we wouldn't touch it, and they didn't touch it. But the thing is, is you're right. They were also incentivized by Microsoft to stay out of the union negotiations. Well, they're incentivized by by Blizzard, 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 too. Yeah. to not form unions. Right. These companies like to ch- tell their employees, hey, it's actually better if you don't trust us on this one. And you always get burned in the end when you do that. Mm-hmm. And so this is just yet another example of that. 
so yeah, ultimately, it's just another one. It's just another story. And this is the biggest one yet. I was listening to a podcast last week where they were talking about like, when is this? When is the breaking point? Because everybody thought the breaking point was the riot story. Mm-hmm. This is worse than the riot one. Like all of a sudden you're talking about one of the major platform holders laying off almost 2000 people. That's just an unsustainable system. Like we've got to figure out how, and maybe the answer is join the union, uh, like figure out how the people who don't make these decisions don't lose their jobs because of decisions that they didn't make. It's just, it's obnoxious. It's video games. I mean, we could go on, but yeah, um, because it butts up with the other big titan, mm-hmm. uh, not big titan, big elephant, metaphorical elephant, but also might be real elephant in the room of <laughs> AI, yeah. um, slowly creeping into all jobs and aspects. Yeah, because not again, just Microsoft's AI, but other AIs as well. I mean, we'll talk about it. it's one of the themes of 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 the movie that we're going to talk about later. But it's very interesting to see how throughout history and in even modern times, people are so willing to disregard the humanity of people and to look past the humanity and just see the dollar signs. It happens oh, we'll in get business. There. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. But yeah, it's like it's such a resonant thing and it will forever be true as long as rich people who want more wealth are making the decisions. It's always going to be like this. And it's because that they just don't see humanity. The empathy isn't there. They just jump to the next dollar sign. And it's, yeah, it causes things like this. Mm-hmm. Just a name and a number. <sighs> anyway. Anyways, what do we say on here? It's a business. Yeah, and that's the dark side of that. Yep. All right. Uh, being a dark side, did you play anything? No. Um... Well, nothing new. I jumped back into po- Pokemon Scarlet after a while. Finished. Okay. I'm finishing up the end game on that because I actually never finished it. Um, I still have a Pokemon kick. I've been watching a lot of Pokemon YouTube videos. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just felt like something, but nothing new. They're gonna get to the DLC or getting ready for a, or, or the second DLC patch. Yeah, that stuff's out, but I just I don't know. I don't. Again, I don't want to spend money. Give them money for something that they never fixed. Is kind of how I feel. <laughs> right. So I'm like, yeah, it's less buggy than it was. It runs slightly better than it did. That's what I will say. And that's well, all I was I've, saying. Uh, so I've been streaming. I did two streams since last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, the Wonderlands. Yes. I think I like it more than you liked it. I thought uh, you would. Also. Yeah. But also, I see the the uh, complaint of <laughs> you're thrown into an area and you have to defeat an X number of enemies, but you don't know the X number of enemies. So it's just kill everything until it says, okay, you're done. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really like that aspect of it. Uh, but story-wise, it, it feels like it's trying to shoehorn a Borderlands story into a D&D campaign when with the uh, Assault on Dragon's Keep, the DLC, was the other way around, and I like mm-hmm. that a lot more. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It's interesting how it tries to do both, because I feel like it it knows that some people are expecting, There's oh, a all of my friends are back. Right. Yeah. Like, they're just expecting, like, oh, no, I need to remember that I'm still in the Borderlands world. All these characters have to be referenced. But at the same time, you can see it's, like, writers trying to be like, no, we kind of want to do something original and have some fun with this premise mm-hmm. and that make some new stuff. And we feel almost hamstrung by the baggage of Borderlands. Yep. Yeah. And then also, I found a way to do crosswords with friends on stream. So and I did that did, for finally. three hours on Saturday. Nice. I might continue to do that um <laughs> make that a, a weekly thing if i can huh. i just have to also be working at the time so i was like well i can't be working <laughs> the whole time so let me just have this going on the side here <laughs> well, and people actually join and like found answers so i was like oh good this is a thing that actually works cool yay me <laughs> <laughs> or yay the channel <laughs> so are you gonna do it this weekend too uh Maybe I might do it on Friday instead. It's a Groundhog's theme. <laughs> well, uh, 
Uh, Christy's off, so actually, if we're not, we're just here and we're not doing anything. Maybe we'll pop in. Hey, you do need your own uh, Twitch account. You can't steal the media, but one. <laughs> I have one, thankfully, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, anyways, um, I think that's it. So that's all we played. Then, if that's all we played, we let's can move on move to on. the second half of the show here. Which is television, and we always start the television section with the sports corner. Oh, real quick, uh, in um, <laughs> video games. Yes. I did try and download Pal World. I did get the game to boot up, <laughs> yes. and it did kick me out uh, as I was doing the character creator. Apparently, that's a <laughs> common bug. Apparently, it is. Wow, okay. So oh, um, dodged a bullet. <laughs> I don't know. My brother played. He said that he liked it. He tried to get me to... to Joined his world, so okay. I'm gonna try and see if I can figure it out this week. If not, I may look into getting a Steam Deck or something portable to play um, Microsoft games on. That is um quite an investment, um, just to get. Not for just for Power World, but just for um for games. Uh, like uh, what's it called? Game Pass, Game Pass Portable, so I can play yeah some stuff. Well, so you should well, know, looking at go, that, or I could just get yeah. the Xbox Series S for three hundred dollars. Like, I could just do that too. You should go. You should know going into this that uh, just a note: um, Steam Decks are not natively compatible with Game Pass. There is a workaround to get it mm-hmm. on Game Pass. What I might do if I were you is I might do some research about some of the Game. Pa- uh, sorry, some of the, some Steam Deck equivalent products like the ROG Ally. I was looking at the because LG those are version. Just, yeah. Those are just Windows and they just run Windows, so they just run Game Pass natively. There was an LG one that has like a switch controls I was looking at doing yes. too. But that's also $300. I'm like, well, I yeah. could do that, or I could do the <sighs> Xbox Series S. At this point, for you, I'm not sure uh what where I would go with that. Because obviously I would probably say the S because Right. Uh, because that way, but the thing is, it's not a portable, and I see why you why you're attracted to the portable idea. Well, also because I don't have to abuse the one screen, the one TV that we have in yeah. our in our place. I think the Steam Deck would be the easy answer if you had an existing Steam library, which I know you don't, I don't. really have. Yeah, so yeah. that's why. That's I'm also my problem. That's why I don't just other stuff. get one is because I don't have, I don't really have that. So right, I'd rather have something that just runs um, Game Pass Game on Pass. it and be fine with well, that. Maybe wait. Because there's two things that you might want to wait for. One, that thing that just passed in Europe related to the Apple Epic case. Yeah. Technically opens the door for other, for game, for Developers Microsoft to create to, a Game Pass app. Yeah. yeah. And if that happens, you'd be able to play it on your phone. Maybe. Or yeah. a future device, say an iPad or something that you could also use on, for other things. So maybe wait for that. Or also that ROG Ally I mentioned, they're actually doing a second edition of it later this year. Okay. Yeah, and so, I know like uh was it Nvidia also has their own mm-hmm. version as well. So yeah, there's a lot of different I, I'm ones look, you can I'm looking into that you can now. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> or you know, just a brand new desktop and laptop. If I'm gonna go into it, I might as well just go into it. <laughs> uh, actually, <laughs> but, uh, there's um, a big limit between spending three hundred dollars for something and then jumping into a twelve hundred dollar like full on mm-hmm. desktop computer. Actually, hold that thought. I might have a conversation for you after this podcast. Oh, no. All right. All right. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll discuss. All right. Anyway, let's move on to actual the sports corner, like we teased. Uh, I'm wearing my um, trash Trash pandas, which I just got in this week. Um, If you don't know. Yes, they are the the double A minor league team for the Angels. I like that's Um, Rocket City raccoons or trash pandas <laughs> yeah rocket city trash pandas anyways uh let's uh talk about some sports headlines this week we start with nascar the clash at the coliseum which is on sunday the, yes the third year in a row uh the still unofficial start of nascar season as mm-hmm. this occurs two weeks before the official start which is daytona uh, which is the week after the super bowl and mm-hmm. the Grand Marshal has been announced and is none other than the co-president of the USFL himself, Mr. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Oh, shit. Because the XFL then starts like two weeks after that. So cross-promotion. Well, it's not called that. The, yeah. It's called the, U, the, U, the UFL, UFL. 
Right. Yeah. You got to get used to calling it the new name. XFL is a new brand. It's not name. the USFL. It's not the XFL. It's the UFL. <laughs> the UFL. They combined it and they dropped the S. Just think of the Weird Al movie U, uh, UHF and you're almost there, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we also have in the Australian Open tennis, we have the number two ranked Ariana Sablanka. Sablanka? Sablanka. And number four, Yannick Sinner win respectively the women's and men's single championships. Yep. Uh, Arna Sablenka beat Coco Goff in the semifinals. And as I predicted, the winner of that match would go on to win the mm. uh, number, the overall championship for the women's yep. side. And then, yeah, surprise, surprise, number four outlasted numbers one, two, and three in the Australia yes, Open. There you go. All right, moving into our league headlines, we have the NFL, of course, is on everybody, everybody's minds because everybody's minds were blown by these ridiculous uh, playoff games that led to our final playoffs. Super Bowl picks. Playoffs, yes, actual playoffs. Playoff games. Yes, uh, unfortunately for the Detroit Lions, uh, the 49ers uh, beat them. Um, sorry, Detroit. It was too well, good Dan to Campbell should have kicked the ball a couple times, but yes. Yeah, maybe. Going and for it on fourth down eventually did indeed bite him back in the ass. Yes, and the Kansas City Chiefs unfortunately beat the Baltimore Ravens. So the thing that we said last week, which was the boring Super Bowl, well, that's what we're getting because that's what we deserve. We will eat our peas and carrots and we will enjoy it. Uh, but there's one person that's probably very happy about this because it's officially Super Bowl Taylor's version as the Chiefs will face the San Francisco Irrelevance, as you call them, representing fear and loathing in Las Vegas on February 11th. So, yes, look forward to a lot of sh shots of not Taylor Swift because she will be in Tokyo performing the Eras Tour. So, yes, <laughs> uh, you won't get Taylor at the Super Bowl, but you will get mentions and references to Taylor, I'm sure. And you'll get Mama Kelsey showing up again and maybe uh, Trap not Travis, Jason, Kelsey, yeah. may or may not have a shirt because it is Las Vegas. It's Las Vegas. The weather will be fine. He better not have that shirt on. I want to see that shirt, that, that man shirtless. We all do. Come on. <laughs> we all do. Uh, also, uh, Kansas City versus San Francisco is a rematch of the 2020 Super Bowl. So that's why this is yes. a Taylor's version. It's a re-release. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yes. Um, yes, it's a re-release of Super Bowl 56, I think. Yeah. Was Is that 60? Was that the last one we watched in the same building? Was that the last one party you had? What was that? February I think so. 20? Yeah. Right. The the small one that we had, yeah. Yeah. We did one the following year when the Eagles won it. But I don't know if you we were there or not. No, I because it let's put it this way. Chrissy and I would not have attended. If it had been in 2021, yeah, we were pretty much on lockdown in February of that year. So no, it was probably 20. Probably, anyway. yeah. And I remember it being the Chiefs because I remember Mahomes being in being being. Playing yeah, this game. does mean that Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs yeah, have back. been in the Super Bowls five of the past six years. With that one year, <laughs> it's when the Rams won it. Yes, they yes, didn't have rag. to face Mahomes. Rag. They had to face Joe Burrow. <laughs> anyway. But yeah, um, congratulations. Oh, yeah. We shall patiently be waiting the Super Bowl commercials in two weeks. Yep. So but for now, you'll be seeing the Super Bowl teaser commercials as they all reference. Yes. Stay tuned to February 11th or 211. Yes, because we love having commercials for commercials, don't we? Yeah, we do. Speaking of commercials, we got another commercial yes. to talk about. Yeah, sort of. Uh, baseball news today is that we have a cover athlete for MLB The Show 24. None other than Vladimir Guerrero Jr. of the Toronto Blue Jays will be on the cover. Um, what? Why are you... Are you? Do you really think there's a curse? No, no, no. I'm not saying the curse. I'm saying this is what he's doing on the cover. Uh, on oh. the cover. He's shushing <laughs> everybody. Oh, see... I didn't realize that that's what you were doing. I thought you were referencing this mysterious curse. Oh, the cover athlete curse? Yeah. That anyone who appears <laughs> as a cover athlete is cursed the next season with an injury? 
Yeah. No, no, no. On the cover, he's doing the the <laughs> um, the searching the crowd as he's rounding the bases for another home run. One of his 47 home runs yeah. as the current home run king. Yeah, I mean, he wouldn't have been my choice. No, no, he, he was doing this on the cover. That's all I was referencing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that makes sense now. I mean, I get, I get why they would go to him. Um, it's also cool, as you note here, uh, that this makes um, a father-son duo as his dad was the cover athlete of the MLB game from this studio back in 2006. I say that because it wasn't called the show yet. Uh, so technically, it wasn't from the same studio either. Well, no, because uh, there was two games. There was ML. There was the show, two oh six, and MLB, two thousand six. We do not have year. time to go into the fact that Sony was publishing two baseball games at the time: one yes. from San Diego and one from nine eight nine. Nine eight nine doesn't exist anymore. We can't do this. We can't. We do not have time to go into this. <laughs> we just did. For all intents and purposes, they were baseball games published by Sony. So no, like they're the same. Let's just call them the same. They come from the same lineage. There's probably a lot of people that were shared between the two studios. Whatever. Anyways, <laughs> close enough. So yes, uh, Vladdy Jr., uh, say hello to the cover. Yes. Um, yeah, it looks like, judging from the cover of this, it looks like they might be going for another fun, colorful design year. And after the boring... A design of 23 i'm all for it let's go let's let's make it interesting looking again yep um uh reading the article of the announcement and apparently this is the, he was announced one by his dad and two oh. as part of like a documentary um of like uh, i want to say either of creating the game or of like players in the off season kind of like the netflix style with mm -hmm. vlad guerrero being one of the featured athletes so Cool. Apparently he was playing the show with his dad and uh, David Ortiz in their home for Christmas. <laughs> I love and this. that's when he announced it to him. Did they have a Did they have a big lunch? <laughs> oh yes, there was lots of big lunch for Big Poppy <laughs> himself. <laughs> Mofongo everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, still my favorite. My favorite. Um... Keenan Thompson, Thompson bit. character. <laughs> anyway, so good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and um, nothing else happened in baseball this week. Oh, uh, well, actually, it was a pretty big, uh, big week for the Blue Jays as they also signed Justin Turner. That's important yeah. to note. But... Yes, that's okay. <laughs> the Angels signed, uh, what was it, the trash guy for the league minimum. <laughs> the trash. Oh, you mean uh, um, what's his name from the Yankees? Yes, where the Yankees will still pay him uh, still eleven pay million dollars. Million. Yeah, and we yeah. get to play him the league minimum. <laughs> Yay! Hicks. Yeah, yeah, Hicks, the trash guy, Hicks, Aaron Hicks. It makes you when you make an outfield move like that. It makes you really wonder about Joe Adele, doesn't it? Let's think about Joe Adele for a second. Remember Joe Adele? <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I'm just glad anyway. that we're paying someone the league minimum. <laughs> for once <laughs> yeah for once god who knows about the Yankees? I don't know. it's just funny to think that the yankees will pay a player 19 million dollars to play for another team yeah turns out anyways let's move on no other baseball stories so let's hit up the uh, basketball baseball league. cap is weird yeah but yeah let's keep weird. let's go into uh M yeah. nba where let's that cap about... is also weird right that also is a weird cap but no cap LeBron James just made history again by being named to his 20th All-Star game, passing the previous record held by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So there you go. Another oh, yes. uh, another stack he is a cap for LeBron. Tin, as he'll be captain <laughs> of one of the West team, and then uh, Giannis Akunta Kempo will be captain for the East team. And they're going back to traditional East-West this year. None of this um, All-Star picks from across yeah. the... Yeah. I didn't like that anyway, so that's fine. All right. Then we also have, speaking of the All-Star Game, that will take place on February 18th at the Gainbridge Fieldhouse in Indianapolis. That is the same day as the Daytona uh, wow. start of NASCAR race. So. Big sports day, then. It's going to be a so big sports day. With that. Yep. Next, we move on to hockey with the NHL headlines. The Edmonton Oilers extend their win streak officially to 16 games. How close are they to some sort of record here? One, one they're one shy, wow. one shy of the record. If they win, uh, do they play today or tomorrow? 
if they win before the All Star break, they will get they will tie the longest streak. Yeah, four wins. Wow, that's exciting. They could do it. Who knows? Let me see here. We're looking for the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, <laughs> just because they're in our division. Um, no, looks like they do not play. Oh. Uh, until after the All Star break. So the next time they will play would be Monday. Okay. Uh, Edmonton plays Tuesday okay. against Las Vegas. Oh shit. As part of ESPN Hulu Plus's like premiere match on right. Tuesday night, okay. so we won't know by the time the next podcast happens if yeah. they have the record or not. We won't know yet, so we'll wait and see. Uh, but they are In going the up mean- against the uh, current NHL champions. Womp womp. Do you think they take womp. a dive? I you mean, because it is I Vegas. Just for the record, ang- I mean, just imagine how angry everyone will be if. Vegas is the one who takes them down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People will be pissed. Anyway. I mean, otherwise, like, who do you think would be the one to take them down? I huh? mean, yeah, it would make sense. Logic would dictate, as Mark yeah. used to say. <laughs> oh, yes. Also, the betting odds in Vegas say the house always wins. <laughs> That's also true. You don't want to <laughs> bet against your, yeah, you bet against the house in Vegas for sure. Well, let's let's put it this way: If they're able to get past uh, Vegas, they would essentially tie it. Mm-hmm. But they would also essentially, kind of de facto, take the lead with their next game because they play the Anaheim Ducks, who ah. are notoriously trash this year. Oh, no. So they would then not only tie by beating um, Vegas, but then most likely become the sole possession of the uh, of the streak at eighteen. Against Anaheim, unless for some godforsaken reason the Anaheim Ducks are the ones who defeat them. <laughs> who knows? It could happen. Weirder things have happened. I don't know, but okay. hey, we'll watch that space. Yes, next week because before that happens, we do have All Star Weekend in Toronto, and Canadian captains Justin Bieber, Will Arnett, and Michael Bublé. Yes, very Canadian, very Torontoian, uh-huh. and also. Apparently, Drake was not involved in this decision-making. Well, good. Keep him away. Uh, anything else in sports before we move on? Uh, this past weekend, saw sports entertainment highlights of spectacular failures on that yeah. of the WWE, which mm-hmm. we have no time to get into, but no, it well, is there also, if you want yeah. to look it up. Well, we can and say I'm talking briefly. beyond what happened at Rumble. Yes. At Royal Rumble. Right. We don't have time to get into Royal Rumble, but we will say just briefly, uh, after recent allegations, uh, again, uh, more allegation, uh, Vince McMahon again has left the organization. Yes. Uh, whether or not this is for sure, who knows, because he always seems to crawl his way back. But this time feels final. So Especially we'll when the uh, district attorney of Florida, I want to say, because their operations are there, um, looking into the WWE's uh, own due diligence internal house account of Vince McMahon's case and what went wrong, who was, what happened, what was hushed. It's very messy and very murky right now. Yes, it's become so much more than just an individual case now. It's more about they need to figure out why this was a systemic thing that was kept secret Mm -hmm. and get to the bottom of that so yeah but for all intents and purposes he is no longer at the company all right let's move on then out of sports and into television news our story today is yet again again about netflix they seem to be popping up every week this uh uh this year so far uh this time uh well hope you like those ads because uh netflix wants you to stick with them they no longer want new or returning or allowing they're no longer allowing new or returning members to sign up for the ad free basic the basic subscription that currently costs 11.99 a month and will be retiring that plan starting with Canada and the UK that leaves subscribers with Netflix's 15.49 per month option as Netflix's cheapest ad free plan otherwise subscribers will have to pay the 6.99 per month for the ad supported basic plan or $22.99 per month 
for the premium tier, which includes extra screens and uh, 4K streaming. Co-CEO Greg Peters said that the ad-supported offering is now at 23 million monthly active users and that Netflix's priority for, its, for it is scale. Netflix also announced that it added 13.1 million subscribers during the final quarter of 2023, bringing its total current number to 247 million globally. So, uh, yeah, this is goes, of course, uh, right after Amazon, in fact, as of yesterday, turned off uh, their basic plan, essentially, by introducing ads as part of it. So uh, this is just them following suit with what their competitor is doing, really. Yep, uh, they did announce that they would provide an a la carte option for the ad-free tier, where if you wanted to add more screens, if you wanted to have a 4K option, if you wanted mm -hmm. to have a download option, it would be in an a la carte basis, which sounds nice, but also you took away the part where that was already offered. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's nickel and diming. Is is they're just going to continue nickel and diming until they somehow make this a profitable business, which I don't think it was ever designed really to be. Uh, but again, that's just the story about these things, and that's going to be how it is until I don't know until the end of time, as long as we're in the system that we're in, and you know, yeah. it sucks. I know. Yeah, part of the allure of streaming was I pay you, I get no ads. <laughs> now it's I pay right. you. And I get ads, <laughs> and, and get ads double dip on more. my money and the ad yeah. revenue money. It's yeah. yeah, they're they're trying to find ways to get uh, make money at some point. Yeah, but alas, we, there's not much we can really do about it now. So instead, we move on uh, to some thoughts. So you watch some television. I'll watch a little television as well. Uh, Did you watch any of these? I watched one of these. We watched. Uh, we wrapped you watched up the one that you Jeopardy. told me. To... What? You... No, you watch... we actually. So yes, uh, you're referring to something I didn't stick with. We actually bailed on the first episode, oh, but okay. uh, we did finish Celebrity Jeopardy, and okay. uh, yeah, as it seems to be the last couple uh, rounds of this, uh, the, just like the first time or like the last time they did this last year, it makes some really compelling television. That was quite a game. That final. I really liked that ending. Uh, yeah. One, because it was surprising, and two, because right. I knew, because I didn't even know what the answer was. Like, yeah, the final Jeopardy answer of spoilers, but the butler did it. I actually knew it, but I'm weird. Uh, so. You actually knew it. Sorry, <laughs> dance. I got it immediately. It was like, oh yeah, it's probably <laughs> probably the most obvious answer you could think of. Chris, the you butler didn't do it, did it. Get it either. It's fine. Uh, but neither what? did you. Them. You beat the librarian. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes it happens. Rarely, but it does happen. Sometimes. But it was book-centric. <laughs> I know, you'd think. Uh, but yeah, no, it was a fun whole... The whole tournament was really fun. Um, mm -hmm. Really good picks. Uh, seemed like they the people that they that moved on really knew their stuff. So, very impressive. Yep. Uh, yeah, I now I follow uh, Katie Nolan on Twitter, and she's funny. No. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know who she was before this. Uh, that's not the... Was she a sports? Yeah, writer? she's the sportscaster. Yes. Yeah. 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 I didn't know who yeah, she, she was. She was good. Was like, yeah, she, yeah she was good on it. Uh, but yeah, bet it all and you lose. <laughs> Turns out that's how that Turns works. Turns out. But yeah, you no, also yeah, it was a fun, game. it was a fun round, fun round. Yeah. You also watch another game show that I'm curious about, morbidly curious about. I saw, I didn't know what this was until I started seeing ads for it when I was watching SNL on Saturday night because I had to watch Dakota Johnson. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, what the hell no are relation. they doing? What? I would you no say no relation. relation? Not that yeah. I know of, no. I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be weird. Um, because reasons. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, no, uh, I saw the ads for Deal or No Deal Island. Yes. So, so you know the classic <laughs> Deal or No Deal. I know of it, yes. Yes, with Howie Mandel. Well, yes. in there, there's always been a third player. There's the contestant. Right. Yeah. There's Howie Mandel. Uh huh. And aside the from all the banker. beautiful models, there is the yes. mysterious banker. Yes. Well, mysterious banker has invited twelve <laughs> contestants to his private island to compete uh -oh. in games where they can win briefcases 
which contain the random assorted amounts of money. And that is the more or less basic uh, explanation of Deal or No Deal Island. So wait, so okay, what do they have to do on this island to obtain these cases? Do they just have to find them? Uh, they play games for them. So it's survival. It's kind of like survivor games, okay. yeah. Right. Uh, the first one was uh, they just dropped them from a helicopter into a mud pit, and they're all unlabeled. So whatever briefcase you get, that you have whatever that money is that goes towards the pot. Also, it's not a one to one million anymore. Mm-hmm. It's a cumulative pot. So however much money the group earns, that all goes into one pot for the finale. Okay. And whoever has the most money after the game gets to choose two people to go to the sudden death and one of them gets eliminated. Okay. So it's it's a twist on the deal or no deal, <laughs> but it does feel more like they just wanted to do Survivor yeah, with a deal wanted, or no deal kind of They wanted to use IP it. that they already own to make a spinoff a new reality show, and this is what they came up with. Yes. It does make me think of something they would have made on 30 Rock. <laughs> no, that was a MILF like... island. That's something different. <laughs> they also did their deal or no deal thing, which was gold case. Do you remember that? Oh, where it was literal gold it's case. Like literally, the, it the, the, the model was like struggling with it. Like, yes. I that one. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the first thing I thought of. I was like, this seems fake. I can't believe that they're doing <laughs> But here we are. But here we are. Um, technically, this will officially premiere in two weeks, but you can watch the first episode on Peacock as an autoplay from the um, games that I watched. So, okay. Yep. Uh, I think about, like I was watching the trailers and then this popped up. And it was like, hey, you like game shows on Peacock, right? Here's your new island preview. I was like, <laughs> well, okay. I guess I was going to watch the first episode eventually. <laughs> yeah. So thank so. you for the preview, Peacock. You're uh, like, your this is my your fate. In the bank. This is my fate. I, this is an inevitable thing that's going to happen to me. Let's get it over with now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm eventually going to watch this. I might as well watch the preview now and just get it over with. But the other thing you watched, though, as you mentioned, um, a couple weeks ago, I said that Christy, Christy and I started this. We watched the uh, part of the pilot, didn't finish it. Uh, ultimately, it just didn't grab us and we didn't come back to it. But you have watched this now. Uh, Hulu. Yes, I did watch the first details. episode now. Yes. Well, because I watched it. I thought you were watching it. No, we, we and don't. I was we like, hey, Matt says it. we's watching it. We should watch it. Well, see. I think you'll have a better time with it than we did. Maybe I don't know. What was your what was your take? Um. So coming off of such great TV murder mysteries of the after party, mm-hmm. both season, the highest season one and the middling of season two, and then of Poker Face, which was all the highs and no lows, mm-hmm. uh, comes death and other details. And it feels like they're trying to take that spin of it, uh, mm. but taking it on the death of a dial course where it's uh pardon the lonely island phrase but on a boat <laughs> yeah it's on a boat. and there's a murder and you're trying to solve it <laughs> with a pashmina afghan yeah uh-huh. <laughs> um but yeah, yeah it's billionaires getting murdered or is it a billionaire getting murdered? Mm-hmm. There just seems so many twists and turns in this thing, just from the pilot itself. Yeah. And at no point in the pilot can you even determine who the murderer is. There's yeah. no, no, nothing that gives it away. It's just, oh, they were murdered in a room. And our main suspect um, named Emojin, because mm-hmm. fancy named people for some goddamn reason. <laughs> I just kept no, thinking no, no, no image and poots. No, no, I, I was, yeah, yeah, was going to say, I just kept thinking of image and poots. Not yes, that's what I kept thinking of too. Yes, but or, or the other just... one was image and heap. Oh, yeah, Ooh, heap what together. you say, <laughs> yes. and you only meant well, <laughs> no, because of you course did. you did. And then, of course, if you uh, if you think about how uh, the, the dear sister SNS sketch, then you're connecting back to the lonely island, and then anyway. yes, <laughs> full circle. <laughs> Full circle. And scene. Unlike death and other <laughs> details, which is not a full circle. This yeah. feels uh, like it's taking random stabs in the dark. Yes. So 
there's that. Really atten- intentionally on that, though. The other big problem I had, and, and I want to get your take on this, is the thing that all the shows you mentioned have in common, including films, recent films that have also tackled this kind of mystery stuff, like Knives Out mm-hmm. and Glass Onion, the thing all of these things have in common that is missing from this show is it feels like all of the fun has been sucked out of it with a vacuum. It's just not fun. It's grimy. It's dram- overly dramatic. It's just there's nothing to really grab onto. I think it's because it's the basic, the, the, the central premise is billionaire boat ride. Yeah. So already, if is, you're not in a billionaire, yeah. like, loving mindset right. and everyone treats each other with such disdain and yeah. backstabbingness a la succession then you're like okay yeah i understand why one of you got murdered yeah. but also do i really want to understand who it was behind it i think the reason why all those shows work though and this one doesn't for me is the fact that you don't really like either of the protagonists here they're both kind of weird the main lady here's, is kind of messed up and you don't want to root for her. Here's the other thing. Um, the person who does die from that first episode only has connection to like maybe two or three of the characters. Yeah. Like interactions. And there's like 10 characters that right. you're supposed to like, uh, like be like, oh, could it be this person? Could it be that person? It's like, no, they only like you only see interaction with like maybe three or four of them. Yeah. So already you're already like eliminating half the cast to why they would be the murderer, which is what the main reason we had issue we had with the after party season two is that of everyone there, only like two or three of them had an actual reason to murder yeah. uh the the suspect. So yeah, it's I don't know if I yeah. like where it's going. Um, ooh, question. How would you feel about the dream sequence from the pilot to where she's like thinking back and hard, hard to think back and be like, oh my God, I it's the same guy. What would you think of that? Lame. Did you hate it as much as I did? Yeah, it reminded me of my least favorite thing about uh, only murders in the building. Which, when it similarly tries to do these metaphorical dream kind of things. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, they did it way less in season three. But that was a thing that they did occasionally in season one and two. That would be like, the show doesn't need this, guys. Like, this show, you already have a tone here. Don't try too hard to make it something it's not. And this show, yeah, it's just, it feels like, it just felt like unnecessary. I agree. Like, it was just like, why are we doing this? I think that the thing about that you need to remember about these murder mysteries is that even if it's very serious subject matter, you can still have some amount of fun. And it's the fun that makes you want to actually find out who did it, right? It's fun to solve mysteries. People who solve mysteries have fun doing it. It's like a puzzle to them. Mm -hmm. You have a character who's literally in the show that's supposed to like solving puzzles, but she doesn't seem to be happy about anything. Like... There's nothing to grab onto. Well, then you have Mandy Patinkin here, who's yeah. great at solving puzzles, but yeah. is reluctant to share any of the information. Right. Yeah, it's just like, and he's not fun. And don't get me wrong, we love Mandy Patinkin. Christy and I saw him in concert earlier, or late last year, like in like September. And he's great. Well, he's wonderful. We love him. Go watch an old uh, DVD of, uh, of him doing uh, Sunday in the Park with George. He's wonderful. But he's wasted here. He doesn't have, he's not looking like, he doesn't look like he has, he has any fun here. He's switching accents at almost like every other scene. <laughs> it's like, Mandy, what are you doing? Why'd you, I'll why'd tell you how the show got made. made. Someone said, <laughs> take White Lotus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Take the after party. Yes. And put it on a boat. No, not even the after party. Somebody saw Knives Out. I think it's trying to do Knives, knives out. out. Yeah. And the White Lotus. I think that they smack those things into each other. But the thing is, is that that's not peanut butter and and chocolate. They think it's peanut butter and chocolate, but it's not. Yeah. Didn't work for me. So I'm glad to hear that you've also gotten weird vibes from it. 
just from the first episode too i yeah, might do the second episode but that first episode just very very off on the wrong foot yeah bad pilot yeah anyway boo bad pilot go away <laughs> bad pilot, bad pilot. all right can we move on now is that all the television yes. we want to talk yes, about? yes we need to move on we have other stuff to really yes, talk about we, we have something we need to go into in depth later so cancellations and renewals is what we'll hit up next and in that case this week we have wolf pack canceled after one season on paramount plus Woo. we have one renewal is it cake gets a third season on netflix so we continue and to have day gets another paycheck yes an existential crisis over whether it is cake or not then we do have one death this is breaking news right before we recorded the podcast cheetah rivera age 91 famous 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 Broadway and film actress was, of course, in West Side Story. Kiss of the Spider, Chicago, won Tony's in 1984 and 1993. A, a Broadway legend, need we say. Yep. Yes. Big name, big name. Yeah, so that's a, that's a sad one. All right, let's move on to the movie section. And we start the movie section, as always, with the weekend box office numbers. Your number one movie is Mean Girls with another $6.9 million. I do believe this is the third weekend in a row yes. for Mean Girls being at number one. Then again, yes. look at the competition. Right. Nothing else is coming out. So that's at $60 million domestic so far. Number two, The Beekeeper with $6.6 .6 million. That's at 41. Number three, Wonka hanging in there against all odds, $5.6 .6 million. That is at 194. Will it make it to 200? Yes. Maybe? Yes. Two more weeks? If it lasts two more weeks, it could do it? If it lasts one more week, it'll do it. It'll do it next really? week. Do you think it'll do better than it's done this week? Well, if it gets 3 million, that's at 97. So it's got to find 3 million somewhere within the week. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Number four, anyone but you. $4.8 million this week. That's at 71. And Migration rounds out your top five. $4.6 million, $101 million. And it, it lifted, it lifted across. Yeah, it did it. It did it. It limped across the 100 match. But the weirdest thing in our in our uh, box office week, you pointed out here, at number six, getting an Oscar buzz bump. Four things coming back to the chart here. $2 million, adding to a measly $24 million. But hey, it's an art piece, and it wasn't going to big make big numbers anyway. Oh, uh, this was very much the Oscar bump of the uh -huh. week. Yes, Oscar bump of the week. There will be more to come, I'm sure. Upcoming this week is not an Oscar film, but um, Christy informed me today that there is some sort of batshit internet rumor that Taylor Swift wrote this movie. Have you seen this? She wrote Argyle. Yeah, that's Christy told me that there's some weird ass internet theory that Taylor Swift wrote Argyle. I'm going to choose not to, uh, not to uh, acknowledge it, but I will say that yes, Argyle is your main release this week. This is a Matthew Vaughn film, though. I know. I'm so confused, right? Like, what? No, no. This is this is this film has uh, like Kingsman mm. vibes all over yeah, it. Yeah, it does. It does, and some sort of cat. Yes, and there's a cat. And there's a cat. So there you go. That's Argyle. like prominent in the marketing, which has to be Argyle. If it's yeah. not, it's terrible marketing. <laughs> yeah, that cat's not Argyle. And I will <laughs> riot. All right, let's move on. Our big story of the of the week in movies is actually uh, stories as we have movie bits. Yeah. We the, start the movie bits. Yeah, Hollywood kind of got back to business after the <laughs> long hiatus. So but, lots of news well, came out yeah. this week. So first, we start with Millie Alcock from House of the Dragon will be Supergirl in the new DC universe. So forget about the Supergirl television show. This is the Super Supergirl who will appear in a film in the DC universe. Also, forget about the Supergirl that appeared in The Flash last year. This is a completely right. new Supergirl. Unrelated. Unsure if she's going to appear in Superman Legacy, but she is supposed to appear in a Warner Brothers film before getting her own film. Got it. So look forward to that. Next up in Netflix news, David Fincher has extended his deal with the studio for three more years. It has now been 10 years since he worked with another studio. And so, that movie was... Oh, that movie? 
Um, yeah, that last uh, gone, student... gone Girl, I think. Was it Gone Girl? That sounds right. Is yeah, twenty fourteen's Gone Girl. Yeah, oh, yeah. But yeah, um, more Netflix movies from David Fincher. Sure, why not? And the main reason they let him do whatever the fuck he wants. That's yeah, that's pretty lucrative if you're a director. Turns out. <laughs> Next up. Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan, who of course previously teamed up to bring us Fruitvale Station, Creed, and Black Panther, will team up again, this time for a vampire period film. Can't wait for that. So, pause on it being a vampire film. It only says that it's a vampire film in one of the tags. Otherwise, Uh the entire log says that it is a period piece film. Secret vampire movie. Secret vampire movie. That's yeah. spoiled by the tags. I would love to see Michael B. Jordan be a vampire. This sounds great. Sign me As up. As one of the comments I saw pointed out, in the alternate universe, this would have just been Blade. <laughs> That's true. Why? Yeah. Mm. What a missed opportunity. Anyway. He would have been a good Blade, I think. He would have been, but too late now. Yeah. Uh, we move on next to Universal and DreamWorks. They will be adapting Dave Pilkey's graphic novel series Dogman into a film for January 2025. So you probably recognize his name as the Captain Underpants guy. Are you familiar with his more recent series Dogman? No. Okay. But so Universal uh, did create the Captain Underpants. Yes. Five years ago now. Right. That movie is now five years ago. Um. Mm-hmm. So. Things you have to know about Dogman. One, he's a cop. Yes. Unfortunately. And two um, is that kids love, I mean, like are obsessed with Dogman. Christy tells me stories about every kid that comes up to her. And if they ask for a book, you flip a coin. On one one side of the coin, it's Diary of a Wimpy Kid. On the other side of the coin, it is Dogman. She says that most kids come in asking just for those two books. Kids love those books. They love Dogman. She says every day she is asked by so many kids about where is Dogman? Can I find Dogman? Do you have Dogman? Do you have the new Dogman? So this is surefire hit. Just out of the out of the gate, this is going to be huge. Uh, but it's getting a January 2025 release date, though. I still one think... can't be completed in a year. Two. Yeah. Are they going to hold that January if it's as big as you think it is? Because I don't think so. Don't underestimate Dogman is all I have to say is that that kids love it, this thing. Also, don't underestimate January releases because as Wonka has shown, family movies (laughs) and nothing else will make money in January. Well, family movies and horror films, but if it's the only family movie in town, maybe Dogman. Maybe. And then we wrap up our movie bits today with the weirdest one of all of them. Pharrell Williams' life will be told via Legos in the October 11th release of Piece by Piece, which is brought to you from Oscar winner Morgan Neville, who directed 20 Feet from Stardom. So this was announced this... yesterday. Yes, this was announced yesterday. So just to be clear here. So this is a biopic about... Pharrell Williams, but it is told through animated Legos. Yes, this is Pharrell Williams' life. Like, all his highs and lows, his ups and downs. But Legos. But in the story of Legos. So, more or less, it's probably going to be based on Pharrell (laughs) Williams' life. Right. With a Lego central character. Yeah, Legos. Titled piece by piece. This is weird. Just gonna say fripping Pharrell weird. or fripping Legos. Which is the weird, weird part? The weird part also, is the Lego part. No, the weird part is the Arby's Lego hat they had to make for this film. <laughs> mm, Arby's Lego hat. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> anyway, so I don't know. That exists and it's coming out this year, so who knows? We'll see. Uh all right. You know. Well, it's got some Oscar behind it because Pharrell Williams is technically uh, Oscar nominated. I guess so. Uh, but speaking of Oscars, a song. Speaking of Oscars, though, all right, we've talked about the... a couple of movies. We've been doing our homework, as we talked about last week. We've been trying to watch more of the Best Picture nominees before the Oscars in March, 
And we've now checked off two more. Well, at least you have checked out two more. I checked off one and a half, but I checked and off the one And then you checked that out I, of one. <laughs> yeah, I checked out on one of them. So let's talk about that one first, because yes. I want to tell you, I think we more or less are on the same page, at least about why we checked out. But you got to the end and share me your uh, sh- share me your secret, because I just couldn't. I was not as strong as you. Spoilers. Michelle Williams dies. And that's why she's Oscar nominated. All right. So Maestro. Yes. Where'd you land by the end of Maestro? Where'd you land on Maestro as a whole movie? As I told you, um, when I said that I stopped halfway through, (laughs) when it went from black and white to color, and I could not for the life of me figure out why the hell it did this. Because there's no inciting incident. There's no big change. It was just, okay, we're in black and white and everything's going great. And all of a sudden we're in color and we're at a party and yeah. people are talking to each other and nothing's really happening. And I'm like, okay, pause, hold on, time out. Why are we in color now? I think it's just literally just passing of time. I think that's why they're doing it. I think it's just the aesthetic. Also, because I think if you did the whole thing in color, the dream ballet thing that they do with the um with uh, when they with, kind of with his inter opening, yes. uh inter uh, what's it called um the musical the ship musical getting the name of that musical the... anyways it wouldn't work if that wasn't in black and white so i guess right. i get it but at the same time you're right. There's no real reason. Most films, when they do this, you're right. There's some sort of transition that makes sense, some sort of thematic change, some sort of thing. But no, not this case. No. Um, it kind of made sense as the more I watch is that when it switched to color, it meant that their relationship was on a more <laughs> rocky surface as yes. Leonard Bernstein was more um, open about his sexuality yeah, um, well, amongst his of, peers, but really, sort, sort of, of, but not really. Of... Still keeping it hidden, but right. also on the rocks with his wife and trying to keep a public image. Yeah. Which is why it was in color because things weren't as black and white as they used to be. I want to say that's the story that he's trying <laughs> to go with. But even that seems more of a stretch, though. Yeah. And I think that I think gets at what you're talking about right now. I think gets at what my think the biggest weakness of this movie is. I think it's too straightforward of a biopic for what it what it could have been. I think if they dug more into the emotions of the care of Leonard Bernstein and dug more into the why he was making the decisions he was and talk more about that part of the story and less about then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Yes, but I think see, it would have been a way a better mu- movie. Yes, but what we're getting to is more of a music theory class of classical no, music even, that, that, people, about, that normal people aren't attuned to. Oh, no, I'm not even talking about his career. I'm talking about the decisions he makes in his life, about does he choose to stay with these people that he's romantically entangled with? Why does he kind of make these decisions instead all you see is he's like all right well i'm not talking to that person anymore now i have this this person okay now we're having trouble oh well i'm gonna go talk to my daughter about this it's like you don't see him stewing with these things the movie needs to keep moving with as his life goes and so you don't get any time to really spend with his character which means that bradley cooper who is also directing this film which is weird he his he has to do so much work as Leonard Bernstein in his performance to get you to feel anything about him. It all is on the performance because the script doesn't help him at all. It it feels like he took a bunch of shots, <laughs> long takes. He likes the long yeah. takes. There's he a lot of long takes long in this takes. thing. He yes. loves the long. He likes you to sit there and think. And then at, at points, I'm like. Wait, did he forget his line, or is he just trying to like draw this out at, at times? <laughs> and that's a bad thing. If yeah, I'm sitting there thinking, think... yeah. when's the next thing that's going to happen? Or, why aren't we cutting away? What, what's the point of you stealing on this scene? We're yeah. done with the scene. The, the people left. You're just following this person now. But why? What's the reason? What's the intent? Do you just want to like yeah. let it breathe? Maybe, like but... 
yeah, yeah. It's, that's a struggle i had ultimately why i only got halfway through it which was aesthetically visually i think there's something interesting here i really like a lot of the setups and i like some of those long shots and i like how it looks the cinematography is very impressive here well that's but, matt libatique yeah cal state yeah. fortune native right so <laughs> there you go uh but yeah so like i really appreciate the look of it and the vibe of it but vibes can only get you so far and i just don't think the script is good enough I so think where, where did a, you stop at then i stopped right after that conversation he has with the daughter exactly an hour and seven minutes in i was like all right <laughs> where the daughter just asks are the rumors yeah. true right and, and it just goes <laughs> Well, no, no, you can't. You can't believe them. No, no. I'm just gonna yeah. live my truth. I'm gonna be happy. You don't need to worry about them. Just be yourself. And that's because I saw such a different version of that scene in my head. And I was like, "There's such a different way of treating this." That I'm just like, "This is not the movie I want this to be." So, I'm kind of disappointed with what it actually is. I mean, I. If you want to take this take, all <laughs> along takes that he does in here all the, like the big one scenes that he does is so it can feel lived in and breathe yeah. that can be true but yeah yeah but i don't care it, about that's the, the idea he that he wants yeah. though that's the idea yeah. he wants but the camera itself just moves so far away from everybody yeah. that you yeah. don't feel close enough to them you feel like you are a bystander watching this happen yeah that and i don't think that that's what you want in a biopic no because you're trying to learn more about the person and to get into the person's psyche and to figure out why they're making the decisions that they make. All you get in Maestro is, here's a here's what this guy did, and this is all the cool stuff he did, and this was all the kind of not so cool stuff he did with his people that he knew, and he, he this paints kind of a weird picture of him. Here you go. <laughs> all this is. So that comes to my second question is, mm -hmm. what's the main struggle that Leonard Bernstein goes into throughout <laughs> his life? I think the I think the movie wants you to think it's his sexuality. The movie want, is set up to for you to believe that this is an internal struggle that he's going, going through. But when you're right, but the thing with Leonard Bernstein is that if you actually look on his life on paper, he was praised in everything he did. He was the greatest person ever. There's one line that stuck out to me that was about, that very, felt very forced. That was based. Somebody is that uh, somebody that's that uh, uh, the guy on the at the table with them is basically with, saying with, like, the, with the recorder, right? Yeah, I think. And then he's he's saying like, yeah, 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 right. It's like, well, you have to like choose whether you want to be the best conductor or stick with musical theater. It's like, and in that moment, I'm like, well, it seems like the movie wants me to believe that this is some sort of choice that he has to make. But if you look at history, he didn't have to choose. He was both. And yes, and you know, there's also, you know, the subject of race does come up. There's a little bit of talk about being Jewish and what that meant for his career and how Jewish he wanted to present himself. It's lightly touched on. I don't know if it goes more into that in the second half. But so there's things like I said, I think my problem is, is that there's things you can objectively say that the movie is trying to do. I'm just saying that there's a is it successful at doing those things is the better question. Yeah, I think that's where the yeah. line comes is it's trying to do it, but <laughs> it never fully gets over that hurdle of yeah. committing to it and doing it. It's just trying to do it. Yeah, and I think you're right to point out that if the camera is physically far away from the subject, the audience is also going to feel alienated from that subject. And I think we're both feeling the same thing, but you're coming at it from the visual and I'm coming at it from the script. But we're yeah. both going the same place, which is the movie doesn't feel like it actually cares about Leonard Bernstein, which is weird for a movie <laughs> that is supposed to make you care about Leonard Bernstein. When both the actor and director are the same person. <laughs> also, you don't have to tell me the thing that happens at the very end of this movie because I read about it and I laughed very hard when I found out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, which part? The uh, REM part or yes. the... <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. I, well, once I read that, I was like, yeah, I don't need to watch the rest of this movie. I'm good. <laughs> I, and I know that now. I'm good. That's like the ending of Tar all over again. Right. <laughs> I don't know. It's... Yeah, because like once Michelle Williams dies and is off screen, then it's like, yeah. okay, now what's holding him back? 
literally nothing and you see that and it's like right okay so the whole point was just waiting for michelle williams to die got it yeah that's that sounds bad but yeah i don't know i'm there's things to like about it like i said i think it's very very visually stunning um and i think that there's some interesting choices directorially that bradley cooper makes here but I think that they need that he for his next project, he should really think about something he really, really cares about, because I think he could make a better movie if he really invested his heart and soul in something. Well, you know, when he spent six years being the voice of Rocket Raccoon. <laughs> There's really so much you can take with that yes. experience. And we're back to Trash Bandits. Wow, he made it. Yes, All right. but now, speaking of trash, we got to talk about Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, come on. Okay, that was bad. You know purpose. that that's not where this is going. Oh, I know. That is completely not where this is going. No. Uh, three and a half hours, and somehow, I kind of still wanted more. I still wanted to see what happened next. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm of two minds about its runtime. Well, part of me thinks that it uses it absolutely does use every minute of that runtime and it uses every scene to a certain extent to move this narrative and i think it all does matter and i get why but man is it a pain in the ass to have to dedicate an entire day to a movie i was thinking today i was like i need to get through this but i have so many other things that i want to do and it sucks yes. that i have to basically it's like I could read a modestly sized book for three hours. Like I could do something else with my time. Like it's just frustrating to me that a movie that movies have to be this long. That being said, it does use that. It uses every second of that to matter. Mm-hmm. And I think that yeah, it is quite a quite a statement that Scorsese can do that this late in his career and still have you wrapped by a story and by his approach for three and a half hours and have you come out on the other end being like yeah yeah i'm glad i did that because it does accomplish that it's it also pulls a lot of scorsese techniques i mean from the man himself yeah. but uses them here not just in vivid ways but also in interesting ways mm-hmm. uh all his interesting camera techniques of running through things running through the house uh yeah. the slow-mos the uh the poignant shots of just people's faces, the mm. stop cuts to black and white for realistic photos, just all the classic Scorsese moves in here, just at its best. Mm. Do we give him a directing Oscar then? So, I, you know, I need to see a few more of these to make mm. that decision, I think, final decision. Uh, but honestly, it is quite an argument. I think it is quite an argument for best director because yes. you're right. It is kind of like a greatest hits of all his best techniques. And also just the fact that he's able to make something this long and and full of content and context and so many characters to keep track of and so many things to remember and make it not feel like a slog. It doesn't feel like you're doing homework or research because unlike Maestro, you do get into these characters' brains. You really get to learn everything about them because you're spending so much time with them and you get to like you get really you get a familiarity and i wouldn't quite call it an empathy because i don't think there are that many people besides of course lily gladstone's character who you really and and her tribe that you really care about like pretty much you know from the jump that these guys leo dicaprio and robert de niro are playing some evil motherfuckers and by the end of that movie you're like yeah they were pretty evil i mean yes robert de niro is more evil and he knows it Leo DiCaprio is more evil, but he's such a dumbass that he can't figure out how two and two to go together. (laughs) But still evil nonetheless. And so, yeah, it's just like, it's such a difference to to compare these two movies to each other because, like, it just, you feel so much differently about this one because by the end of it, you're like, yeah, no, like, I spent some real quality time with all of these people. As much as Leo likes working with Scorsese. I feel like Tom Hardy could have done a better job in playing oh, that, like that yeah. that fine line between smart and dumb. <laughs> yeah, man, his character in this is so fascinating because it's like 
it kind of reminded me a little bit uh and maybe that's just because i've been talking about it lately well no not really where it's like i feel like we all know that person right where it's like this person who is like this is is very into a per like like very in dedicated to a relationship who is a very you know subjectively good boyfriend where like oh like they do all the right things but then they're not actually zooming out and looking at like what they're actually doing like mm -hmm. how their personal life affects the relationship how their like business like their maybe their job affects their relationship and this is like that idea times 100 he never even thinks about oh the shit that i'm doing is actually set up against me because of this person i actually do care about a lot like it doesn't even he doesn't even it's not even a blip on his radar he's somehow separated the two in his mind completely <laughs> it's the uh what is it what's the phrase uh god he's it all the time um out of sight out of mind yeah <laughs> where he's so focused on what's currently in front of him whether it's uh, Willie Gladstone's character and mm. his wife, or it's Robert De Niro and his uncle, and yeah. it's just, okay, yes, you're talking to me, and you're fully investing in me, and I am fully investing in you right now. And now you're away. Okay, now I'm fully invested in you. I'm going to worry about you. I'm yeah. going to take care of you. Mm. Oh, but I forgot I did this other stuff to your family. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Up until the end, which is basically him finally being like, all right. Well, I do want to go back to them, so I guess I gotta just tell the truth after all. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. I guess I'm here. It's just, it's so funny, but it's it hits on something really important, which I referenced earlier, which is the whole movie's theme, which is this has happened, this is happening, and this will forever happen, because that is just the nature of certain kinds of men. They will forever take advantage of power when they have the ability to take advantage of power, whether they realize they're doing it or not, whether it's for malicious purposes or just because they can do it because nothing ever comes up in their mind saying like, you probably shouldn't do this. There are just people who just do not have the empathy to consider the larger ramifications of their choices. And this movie is such a great encapsulation of that. And because it's taking a very true, very real, and very like in like this story, this real these real events have actual implications for how crime is treated in the United States history. This is largely why the FBI exists, this case. And so you have to kind of like 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 you can and, and so I think it's the perfect story to investigate these themes, right? Because Scorsese is making think about like well no think about right now there's so many parallels like De I know De Niro is not trying to do a direct comparison to Trump here but there are a lot of parallels there was one line in, in specific that made me immediately think of Trump when he said it and it was something I wish I could remember what it was I wish I wrote it down it was something about like about like oh well it's like Fam fa family only lasts like a, a like a, a little bit the, but the money will last forever or something like that it just made me think of this very trumpian mindset of this ends justify the means kind of mindset that you're willing to sacrifice personal relationships for some sort of financial gain some sort of gain of power some sort of intellectual power that you're having over people and these are just people that refuse to like just are so one track minded about this and the fact is, is that if you look at the history of, of, the, of the country, the United States is built on that premise. That's why we're here. That's why all of these things exist is because men took advantage of people that, like, that basically just, it just vanished. We're, like, were destroyed. Cult, entire cultures destroyed um, because people wanted their money and didn't care about their them as people. They were willing to look past the humanity to just look past, to get their goal, their thing accomplished. Not just look past, but just completely ignore the humanity. Even the movie opens up with this person died, yeah. no investigation. This person right. died, no investigation. This person died, no investigation. 
and just a repeat to where you actually see the murder happen mm-hmm. and no investigation, no investigation. Mm-hmm. Um, even so much as the, the like uh, Leo character slowly poisoning his wife, mm-hmm. slowly poisoning, right. yes, not it's knowing what he's doing, yeah, right, yeah, the metaphor just slowly eating away at, yeah, yeah this because he doesn't even realize he's doing, mm-hmm. he doesn't even think about any of it, he just lots thinks of like, layers, yeah, he just thinks about these are relationships that I have and I want to maintain them. Mm -hmm. He doesn't think about what that actually means, what he's actually carrying about. And it goes to that recurring theme in a lot of Scorsese's movies about just senseless violence. And I don't mean like senseless violence and they like, oh, you should censor that way. I mean, literally senseless violence. There's no sense to it. There's no reason why it had to be perpetrated beyond Mm -hmm. selfish, like beyond somebody's selfishness or someone's, you know, like ability to gain from it. Like there's no reason for this to take place. And this is just another example of it. Like, it's just such a compelling story, and it's told so well, and it's directed so well, and the performances are so good. I'm not even that much of a Leonardo Leonardo DiCaprio guy, but he does a pretty good job in this movie, and so does Robert De Niro. But I mean, obviously, Lily Gladstone is the the heart of this thing. Like, hey, I told you, she just put pencil in already. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I'm fully convinced now. I think that there's no way she loses this because she's just, she's the reason why it all works because she's mm-hmm. the, like, she's the soul. She's the heart because she's the thing that keeps it going. And it's just, she is the flower moon. <laughs> I guess so. Sure. And it's just like, it's, it's, it never feels excruciating, which is the, I think the biggest trick that this movie pulls off is that it talks about such terrifying subject matter and it's such heavy stuff. But it never feels like you're like drowning in it because it just keeps going and you're so invested in it. You're just like, all right, well, okay, what's going to happen to this person when they do this? And like, what's going to, what's the next thing here? Even though it's just like the most brutal thing, like you've ever, you, when you actually think about it for a second, like, wow, this is actually really messed up that all of this just happened unchecked for as long as it did. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will end with this. Um, as the movie does end with it as well. Yeah. Typically, Scorsese loves to point the mirror up and just show the right. audience right back at them, like he does did with uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Um, just the pan over the audience at the very end. He himself steps out onto the stage yeah. and delivers the final monologue of the film. Very poignant, very in your face, very, I am telling you this, right? not as a story, Right. But as a cautionary tale. Yes. Please heed these words. Right. Like this is this is what our society was built on the backs of. Like, mm-hmm. and this is in front of you being shown to you how it went down, how it's like I said, still happening largely. It's the whitewashing yeah. that he goes into as well. Yeah. And of to history. be fair, we should also mention that yes. Do I, would I also like to have someone from the Osage tribe write their own, like make their own art about this? And do I want to get their perspective? Absolutely, please. The thing about that I like about this is that it does open a door for that to happen. I would love to see a counterpoint because I know that there's been some discussion from the tribe being like, well, if we had, the, if this was created by the Osage people, we would have a conversation from our point of view, and we shouldn't necessarily be, you know, viewing it through the lens of 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 a white person. You know, I get it, I hundred percent get it. But the thing is, is that both can exist. I think there is a poignancy and a reason for this art to exist, and so I think that also that art should exist. I think that this opens the. This is an opportunity now for somebody to make that story. Please do. I I welcome it. I would also be interested in seeing that. And I think it would offer some more dimension that I think would be really cool to see. So I just wanted to mention that, which is like, yeah, I'm not, I, I am aware that, you know, it's not going to be perfect no matter what they're going to do. But I don't think, but I think for what it does and the story that is trying to be conveyed here, it does it in an exquisitely artful way. And I think it really gets the point across. And I think it really tell, does what it needs to do by telling these people's story. Uh, yeah, for what it is, I think. I think. And so, yeah. Yeah. We will talk more about it as we get closer to Oscar season and compare it mm-hmm. to the rest of the other nine films. 
Yes, exactly. And not it's Tim because Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there in about a month or so. Yep. In the meantime, is there anything else we need to talk about with movies? Uh, I don't think so. No. Okay. Okay. Well, in that case, that will do it um, then for the movie section. I will try and f- watch Anatomy of the Fall. That's probably the next one on my list I'm okay. trying to watch. All right. Um, Oppenheimer, as I mentioned, comes out next month. Yeah. Uh, Past Lives, Poor Things. I think or it's currently in theaters. And then Zone of Interest, I want to say, is on Max right now. But okay, not certain about that. Might be. Um, yeah, I, I I might watch Past Lives tonight. Okay. I might I might uh, rent that one. So yeah, we'll be able to talk about more next week. So look forward to that. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us for this special 420 Blaze It episode of the Media Book Podcast. We did not blaze it, but if you did, I hope you had fun. Uh, we'll be back next week for another episode with all that and more. If you want to tune in, you can check us out on YouTube. Search youtube.com for Media Book Podcast. And you'll find our channel there. Like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications when new videos go live. You can also find us on social media. Or sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. You can also find us in audio form if you like listening with your earphones on. Uh, podcast services such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Amazon, iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us by searching Media Boat Podcast. You can also find us on social media where on Twitter we're at Media Boat Cast. You can find us streaming video games. You've been streaming up a storm on twitch.tv slash mediaboat if you want to check that out. Solve some crosswords with us this weekend. You can also find us on um, mediaboatpodcast.com where we serve an archive of our old shows as well as other things. Stay tuned for our Oscar, uh, or not Oscar, Grammy uh, picks before the telecast on Sunday. We'll have our predictions up there for you to see how wrong we are. In the meantime, we're probably more wrong than most people. (laughs) Maybe. We'll see. So thanks for joining us. We'll be back next time, next week, right here, same place. So see you then. Be back with more news, more thoughts, Grammy award winnings next week. Indeed. Okay, bye.